Hello, it's Scott Manley here. This week we had a rare launch from the Wallops flight facility using a Minotaur IV rocket. It was carrying a classified payload for the National Reconnaissance Office, and as rockets go, Minotaur IV is kinda small, but its launch is pretty darn spectacular due to its high thrust to mass ratio, which means it leaps off the pad and goes supersonic inside something like 15 seconds. And this is because it used to be an ICBM, and when I say that, I don't mean that its design was based on a nuclear missile, I mean that in the late 1980s, this rocket was built and deployed as a peacekeeper missile, inside a hardened silo with up to a dozen nuclear warheads on top, ready to launch at a moment's notice. The missiles were retired between 2003 and 2005, and over the next few years, Orbital Sciences Corporation adapted them into the Minotaur IV launch vehicle, with the first launch being in 2010. Since then, Orbital Sciences has become part of Northrop Grumman, and right now they're the only US launch provider that uses former ICBMs as launch vehicles. In the early days of the US space program, the launch vehicles were all copies of ICBMs you know, built in the same factories. Atlas, Thor, Titan, they were all used, but the cryogenically fueled Atlas and Thor did not have long lives as weapons. The Thor was retired in 1963 and Atlas retired in 1965, and this left hundreds of missiles available, which were then adapted into launch vehicles. But the Minuteman missiles that replaced the Atlas remained operational for much longer, and it wasn't until 1994 that DARPA started looking around for ways to adapt them to a space launch vehicle. And that was when Orbital Sciences stepped in. They proposed placing their existing Pegasus launch vehicle on top of a Minuteman first stage, thus creating the Taurus rocket, and it flew three times in this design. Now, the Taurus would subsequently be upgraded with a commercial Castor 120 as the first stage. This was built by Alliant Tech Systems, and this gave it slightly more payload, but more importantly, it freed the rocket from a law that only allowed ICBM boosters to be used to launch government payloads. The Taurus went through several iterations, stretching the various stages and improving its capability, until it had a pair of failed launches which were ultimately attributed to a supplier who had forged testing data. Taurus was subsequently rebranded as Minotaur C and it's made one launch since then in 2017. The design is able to launch about 1400 kilograms into low Earth orbit. So now if we rewind a bit into the 1990s, Orbital Sciences kept working with the Minuteman boosters that they'd got experience with, and they created the Minotaur rocket out of a Minuteman first and second stage, with the third and fourth stages being taken from their Pegasus XL. This was a much smaller design, but it was a lot cheaper since the only new boosters being paid for were the third and fourth stages. It would be able to put about 600 kilograms into low Earth orbit. And so I guess I should pause and talk about the Minuteman 2 and its capabilities. So the Minuteman is a three-stage solid propellant driven booster. The first stage is based around a thia called TU-122 and it delivers about 80 tons of thrust for about 60 seconds of flight. And if you look at the bottom, you'll see that it has four nozzles. To be clear, there's a single solid rocket motor in there. It feeds all four nozzles simultaneously, but those nozzles can be individually gimbaled to give the rocket yaw, pitch, and roll control. The second stage is an Aerojet SR-19 AJ-1, and it gets about 28 tons of thrust for about 67 seconds. This stage has a single fixed nozzle, and for steering, instead they use a process called liquid injection thrust vector control. So inside that nozzle, there's a ring of injection ports where they can inject a powerful liquid oxidizer, and when that's injected, it accelerates the reaction where that's injected. So if they inject only on one side, they can create an excess of thrust on one side of the nozzle, and that will give them pitch and yaw control. The roll control has to be provided by small thrusters on the bottom. The third stage of the Minuteman isn't used on Minotaur 1, but it's worth a mention. It has a thrust of 15 tonnes, and it also uses liquid injection thrust vectoring. 
It also incorporates a feature called thrust termination ports. Those are doors that open on the side of the combustion chamber, and those basically blow open at the exact moment when the uh, missile is headed towards its target. It stops excess thrust from the solid rocket motor carrying it beyond the target. And that is how you get accurate targeting for your nuclear warheads when you're using a solid rocket motor. The Minuteman 3, it actually had multiple warheads on it and it would have a final stage that had liquid uh, fueled motors which could independently retarget each of the warheads to make sure they hit their appropriate target. So anyway, the Minotaur 1 was first flown on January 2000 and it launched from Vandenberg with a number of small satellite payloads to prove that it worked. The Minotaur 2 is actually a downgrade of this. It removes the fourth stage and it was actually used for launching suborbital tests, things like target for ground-based missile defense systems. So now the Minotaur 3, uh, for that the orbital science has switched over from the older Minuteman 2 to the larger and more powerful Peacekeeper missiles. The Peacekeeper is a three-stage design. The first stage is an SR-118 built by Thiokol, and that gets about 220 tons of thrust for just under a minute. Although the thrust actually varies a bit during this thrust, and if you listen to the recent launch, you'll actually hear one of the controllers call out the peak thrust, and that peak thrust is about 10% higher than the initial thrust. The second stage is an SR-119, and that's manufactured by Aerojet, and it delivers about 125 tonnes of thrust for 60 seconds. Finally, the third stage is an SR-120, that's made by Hercules, and that only gets about 30 tonnes of thrust. So these three stages in total uh, come out to be about 90 tonnes. The next stage depends upon the specific Minotaur variant that's in use. So the Minotaur 3 is another suborbital test vehicle with a fourth stage that is supposed to have a liquid fueled propulsion system that enables very accurate trajectory control. But as far as I can tell, this variant has never actually flown. The Minotaur 4 is of course the version that just launched. Uh, there's three versions of this. The regular Minotaur 4 uses the Orion 38, while the larger Minotaur 4 Plus uses the Star 48. And they're both solid rocket kits, kick stages. The number refers to the diameter of the stage in inches, so the 48 has more oomph than the Orion 38. Both configurations also offer a liquid fueled stage on top for more accurate orbital injection, and that whole design together will, will apparently place up to 1.9 tons into low Earth orbit. The third version of the Minotaur 4 is called the Minotaur 4 Lite, and that again eliminates that upper stage and can be used for suborbital tests. And this was a configuration that they used in the first flight of the Minotaur 4 in April 2010. They were launching a vehicle called the HTV-2A, the hypersonic test vehicle, which was launched up to about Mach 20 and then was supposed to perform a hypersonic glide skipping over the Pacific towards Kwajalein Atoll. There were two tests of these. Both of them disintegrated before they completed their test. The first orbital launch of the Minotaur 4 was in September 2010. It was carrying a test version of the space-based surveillance spacecraft. And this is a spacecraft that carries like a 30 centimeter telescope and it's designed to inspect other satellites. This was only the Pathfinder mission inten intended to test the design in space. And since then, they've taken that design and launched them on much bigger rockets into very high altitude orbits so these satellites can investigate other satellites in geostationary orbit. So, there is a Minotaur 5 which has been used, and it's a five-stage version. It, it takes, the, again, the first three stages of the Peacekeeper, and on top of that, they add a Star 48, and then on top of that, there's a Star 37. And this has only flown once in 2013, and then it sent Lady spacecraft to lunar orbit, and it also sent a frog uh, flying and into internet fame. There is a Minotaur 6, which has been talked about, and what they do is they just take an extra Peacekeeper first stage and stick it underneath the Minotaur 4, so that again creates a five-stage rocket, and I think that design is claimed to be able to launch three tons to low Earth orbit. So yes, yeah, not flown, but it looks like Northrop Grumman still has it listed on their books. Right now, the only planned launches for the Minotaur rockets are for Minotaur 4 variants. 
Anyway, a curious feature for all these rockets built from ICBMs is that they're legally prohibited from being used for commercial payloads. And this was a policy that was advanced in the 1990s and was largely driven by lobbyists for existing rocket builders like McDonnell Douglas and Lockheed Martin. And they didn't want their launch vehicles to be undercut by cheaper alternatives. One of their arguments was that allowing these new space corporations to buy cheap ICBM boosters would violate international trade agreements restricting governments from subsidising industries. But equally, it was obviously a waste to let those expensive boosters to go to waste, so the compromise that was reached was to allow only government payloads. In 2016, there was a uh, number of people calling to have this rule reversed. Uh, notably, one company that had previously been against the use of missile boosters had changed its position. Alliant Tech Systems, you remember they made the Castor 120 stage that was substituted for the, the Minuteman on the Taurus? Well, you know, they had at the originally been against it because they wanted to sell more boosters, but by 2016 they had merged with Orbital Sciences to make Orbital ATK, so they had changed their position. The situation was reviewed by the Office of the Inspector General and they noted that yes, it would make a great deal of sense to use these old boosters that were sitting in warehouses, but they decided to leave the rules in place since there was only one company that would have benefited from the rules being changed and that would have then likely led to accusations of favoritism. The US isn't the only country in the world which is pressing former ballistic missiles into use as launch vehicles. Russia does this as well. They have the Dnieper and the Volna, which is actually the only space launch vehicle I can think of that is launched from underwater. In all these cases, I find it fascinating that many of these rockets have sat in storage for decades and they're pretty much still ready to go at a moment's notice. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.